Good evening, everyone. We will be starting shortly. We're just waiting for the room to populate. Good evening, everyone. We'll be starting in a couple of minutes. We're just waiting for the room to populate and then we'll get the show started. Good evening, everyone. We'll be starting in about one minute. Thank you for your patience. Okay, let's get started. All right, hello everyone. Good evening. My name is William Johnson. I am the program director for Penn Across America, and I would like to welcome you to the, to, to the virtual room tonight. Tonight is the kickoff event of Penn America Miami South Florida chapter. This is the opening of the chapter. We're using this virtual room to celebrate um, the opening of this chapter. Um, tonight, we're all going to go on a phenomenal journey. There are some stellar poets being featured tonight. And um, before we start, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work we do at Penn. But even before I do that, I just want to acknowledge um, how devastating the last couple of weeks have been. I mean, not just weeks, how devastating this year has been. Um, I am not sure if this reading is going to offer any solace, but I am sure that it's going to offer enlightenment and community, um, which I really believe in these troubling times is vital. Uh, I do believe that our solidarity is our strength. So I look forward to moving forward with all these poets tonight in community and solidarity. So this event is presented in partnership with PEN America. And if you're not familiar with PEN America, we are an organization that stands at the intersection of literature and human rights to protect free expression in the United States and worldwide. PEN America champions the freedom to write. It recognizes the power of the word to transform the world. We are thrilled to be celebrating the launch of Miami South Florida chapter, led by Marcy Cancio Bello and Leslie Saez. Within the larger organization, the PEN Across America program provides resources to mobilize PEN America communities around the country in 2019, Penn announced six new chapters in Tulsa, Birmingham, Detroit, which is my hometown, Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, the Piedmont region of North Carolina. And so we are really thrilled to be launching the Miami South, South Florida chapter here tonight. Our Penn America chapters are doing fantastic work, including organizing public forums, hiding, highlighting the work of local journalists, hosting literary conversations and events just like this one. To learn more about what PIN is doing, please visit us at PIN.org. And the best way to continue to support this work is to become a member. 
Our strength is in our membership, which includes a nationwide community of novelists and nonfiction authors and poets and editors and screenwriters and playwrights, publishers and agents and other literary professionals. And even a larger network of devoted readers and supporters who join with them to carry out PEN America's mission. As a PEN America member, you have a unique opportunity to play in the defense of free expression and the celebration of literary excellence. We need your voices and we need your support. So please join. I will put in the chat a link if you are interested in joining. And now let's get this event started. I will pass the baton to Marcy. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, William, for uh, that wonderful introduction and for all the work that you and the rest of Penn are doing. Um, Leslie and I are absolutely thrilled to be able to join forces and expand Penn's reach through the Miami South Florida region. And we're really excited, especially for tonight's kickoff for these four incredible poets. Um, I would like to begin with, uh, with saying that we are joining from right here in Miami, Florida, both Leslie and I, which is the traditional territory of the Tequesta, Taino, Seminole, and Nikashoge peoples. And we do want to acknowledge this and honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations. And this calls us to commit to continuing to learn how to be better stewards of the land we inhabit, um, all of us wherever you happen to be. Um, for those of you who, are, who are, have already found the chat, please do introduce yourselves, say hello, give a little bit of love and let us know where you're zooming in from. Uh, Leslie's gonna drop a tool into the chat that will help you find the traditional land name of your area too. And it is a, a great place to start to begin educating yourself if you haven't already, um, but it is definitely not the end of the work. Um, this night would not be possible without our partners, uh, Books and Books, which is our local ind independent bookstore. And we will be linking tonight to everyone's incredible work so that you can get your own copies uh, to be able to enjoy, uh, not just tonight, but for the rest of this year. Um, we also want to thank our other partners, the Cubic Center, uh, Miami Book Fair, Oh Miami, Reading Queer, and Supporting Women Writers in Miami, also known as SWIM. Um, and huge shout out to all the Pan America staff who've made this possible, uh, Rebecca Warner and Grace Linzer, of course, William Johnson, uh, local board member, Tom Healy, and all the Pan members in South Florida and across America. The work that, that this organization does is absolutely vital um, to continuing to educate and impact and make real changes. Um, but also thank you all for joining us, whether or not you are a member. Uh, super quick housekeeping notes. Um, for those of you who found the chat, I see it's already a little bit active, but there is also a Q&A function. After the reading with these four poets, um, we will have a bit of a conversation and we would love to hear questions from you. And the, these questions are uh, for the poets, for Penn, um, all of us staff to see. We'd love to hear what you would love to see in the area, um, what you could envision us doing as a chapter. We are a community together. So without further ado, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our very first reader of the evening. Sam Obaid is a masculine performing Indian lesbian raised Hindu on her mother's side and Muslim on her father's side. She moved to the US in 2007 where she earned a second and third master's degree in multimedia journalism and gender studies respectively. An activist, poet and educator, she has been featured at New York and Poets Cafe, Bowery Poetry, Busboys and Poets, University of South Florida, and many, many more places. Her work has also been featured on Button Poetry and an international anthology, The World That Belongs to Us, an anthology of queer poetry from South Asia out by Harper, Harper Collins, India. Please give a warm round of virtual applause to Sam. Thank you so much, Marcy. I appreciate that introduction. Um, big thanks to both Marcy and Leslie and congratulations on starting this wonderful chapter. Thank you to Penn as well for organizing this event. I'm very excited to be here. Um, so this first poem that I'm gonna do for you uh, has a little profanity in the title, it's called Gender Fuck. Um, and it is as promised about gender. So this is the first poem. There is nothing here. There is nothing here but a blank slate. There is nothing here but flesh and blood and skin 
and bones, and then she appears. She stands here naked for the first time. Body scarred with violence she has not yet feared, face lined with stories she has not yet told. She stands here naked for the first time too long, crouched, cringing, waiting for cover. Her Muslim heritage has taught her well that this body bears no ground for pride, and then he appears. He stands here naked for the first time, clenched fists covering her breasts, spine erect, butch present. He stands here naked for the first time too long. He is nothing without the absence of her. She is no one without the fallacy of him. Together, they become. The thing about identity is, we are always ready to check each other into boxes, even when there's no paperwork to be done. I am an independent woman, but one of my closest friends sees it fit to call me sexist when I say I'm uncomfortable being financially supported by a significant other, even though I have no problem if she decides she does not want to work a day in her life. I ask her to think about what she has just said. If maybe I look more feminine, she may have had a different opinion, or if maybe she would have respected the independence I learned at a young age I must never give up by consequence of being a woman, we are both women. I just wear mine differently than you yours. There is a compulsory misogyny that comes with this identity that can be so blinding you completely miss the point so quick to label me in your own image. All of a sudden, I am not woman enough to understand. All of a sudden, I am not my mother's daughter, but my father's son. The thing about identity is we are always ready to tell someone else who they are so we can see ourselves in them. Universe forbid we should ever say, I don't understand, tell me more. So when I do, it appears I impose my identity upon you. Please know I'm not honored by the look of surprise on your face when I tell you my pronouns are female. Please know I'm not honored by the look of surprise on your face when I tell you consent applies to me too. Human nature requires that we destroy that which we do not understand. So we take difference and fix it into a box. One size fits too small. We peel back its skin and rip through its flesh until we break its every bone and bleed it soaking wet until there is nothing here. There is nothing here but a blank slate. There is nothing here but flesh and blood and skin and bones until we disappear. Thank you. Um, so for my second piece today, gender is something that I write about very frequently because it appears very frequently in my life. Um, the other poem that I would like to do for you all is about what it's like to be an immigrant woman living in the United States. I wrote this a couple of years ago and it has seemed relevantly relevant throughout the course of these past many years that it has existed. Um, it's a very simple title. It's called The Immigrant Poem and this is what it goes like. Some days, the most honest thing that I can do for myself is to listen to the sound of my heart beating. In the morning, right before I wake, right before reality seeps its way through to remind me of this thing called surviving, there is a brief moment before I open my eyes when the only sound I hear is a soft snore of my puppy peaceful at the edge of my bed and the loud, persistent comfort of my beating heart. I wonder, is this what freedom sounds like? I watch young white boys get their driver's permits like awards that celebrate the mediocrity they will shine on for the rest of their lives. Tongue carved in, tongues carved in colonial tradition, learning only ignorance is second language, speaking of the legality of a back door while lining the gates at the front with guns aimed at black and brown children. This country is not a nation of immigrants. It is a land that was imagined on the genocide of native humans built on the backs of slaves and devised to hold the heads of minorities underwater while still forcing us to breathe. The life of an immigrant woman is not for the faint hearted. It requires years of practice walking on eggshells around your own existence, testing the pain tolerance of your own skin, looking around your own home to see if anyone's watching when you kiss your lover, watching over your shoulder when dancing at a nightclub, hoping that you don't accidentally speak your beloved first language at an airport. I wonder if I'll ever hear my heartbeat without trying. Perhaps this is what freedom sounds like. 
Millions of hearts across the world beating harder every day. I wonder if this is why mothers of dead children cradle their heads to the, their chest. So the last thing their souls will hear is a steady beat of a mother's heart over the deafening sound of a racist bullet. I wonder if the founding fathers held their palms over their hearts when taking the Pledge of Allegiance to drown out the humanity of their heartbeats. I wonder if fake leaders rely on their heartbeat to give them rhythm when reciting prayers so they can drown out the sound of hate. I know that my heart heartbeat gets louder with every line of this poem because my word is my everything. I know that an activist speaks from their heart no matter how afraid their mind is. I know that no wall can keep our community away from us as long as our hearts are beating. I wonder if freedom will ever be our first language. I know this fight won't end in my lifetime. This legacy has outgrown its roots, but decades from now, when this country elects to its highest office, a queer transgender hijabi Muslim woman of color who came to this country undocumented, ran her whole campaign on her history of being a sex worker, partnered with a gender non-conforming woman of color who raises pit bulls as children, I know then we will hear the future of our heartbeats beating loud and clear, sounding well over the history of white supremacist patriarchy and none of us will ever forget where we came from. Thank you so much, y'all. It is such a pleasure to be able to share this space with so many other amazing humans. I'm very honored to be here. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Sam. That was absolutely breathtaking. I feel like I'm still sort of clutching my chest. Um, so allow me to catch my breath real quick before I <laughs> introduce our next fabulous leader. Juby Ariola Headley is a Black queer poet, storyteller, and first-generation United Statesian who lives with his husband in South Florida. He's a 2018 PEN America Emerging Voices Fellow, holds an MFA from the University of Miami, and his poems have been published with Ambit, Beloit Poetry Journal, Literary Hub, Nimrod, Southern Humanities Review, The Nervous Breakdown, and elsewhere. Juby's debut collection of poems, Original Kink, is available now from Sibling Rivalry Press. Please help me in welcoming Juby. Thank you so much, Leslie, for that welcome. Thank you, Marcy and Leslie, for the invitation. Thank you to Pan America. I can truly say I wouldn't be as a poet where I am today without Pan America. And we'll talk more about that, I think after we hear from all our poets. And thank you poets for being in community with me tonight. It's been a hard day, week, month, year, decade, lifetime. And I need it as much tonight as I need it any night. Samira, thank you for leading in with that fire and that truth. It sets a tone in the bar that I'm gonna endeavor to at least approach. My first poem is called We, simply We. And it's called We because it's an exploration in Abbasidarian form, in very lean Abbasidarian form of the first word of the constitution um, and who we really are. We is abscess, is bootlick, is cat call, is death drop, is end zone, is fist bump, is gaslight, is hashtag, is ink blot, is jail bait, is kill shot, is lockdown, is murder, is murder, is murder, is night stick, is outlaw, is predator, is quarterback, is race, I mean rape, I mean rage, I mean Superman is trespass, is uppercut, is vulture, is whitewash, is xenophobe, is y'all, is... I don't read that poem very often because it kind of takes a lot out of me. Um, and I promise I won't leave us there. Um, the next poem I'm gonna read, I think of at least, as a bit more helpful uh, or hopeful rather than helpful. I don't know if it's helpful at all. Um, I can't promise that unfortunately. And I'm gonna read it from the book because my PDF is acting up. 
And this poem is simply called America. I confess, America, I will never consider suicide. I love rainbows, sure, but what I'd really miss is carrot cake and cum. I've dreamt your murder a million times, just a tiny little death, America. I've pitchforked you until you geysered my birthright all over me. Was it good for you too, America? I'm a freak, America, a peeping Tyrone. I fashion a fetish out of outside looking in. I'm a schoolgirl, America, 13, going on gutted, all fast talk and first kiss and last to be picked. I'm a cowboy, America, 13, going on gelding, all curse words and swagger and shirts versus skins. I'm a symphony of breaking bones. I'm shredding skin on concrete canvas. I'm a teaspoon of history whisked into a pound of lies. I am original kink. Yes, I am the shackled serpent. Yes, I am Jesus to your Judas. Yes, I'm the patron saint of probable cause. What do you think, America? Does this poem earn me an FBI file? This is not a manifesto, America. This is not a ransom note. This is not a Dear John letter. This is not an invoice. This is a dare. I dare you to love me, America. I dare you to love me like it's legal. Thank you so much, everybody. Wow, Judy, thank you for that. Um, two incredible poets already. We're only halfway through. If you're not getting goosebumps and taking deep breaths, you should. Um, uh, our next, our next reader to follow this, this fire reading, which is giving me life, uh, Roy G. Guzman was born in Tegucigalpa, Honduras, and grew up in Miami, Florida. Their debut collection, Catrachos, was published by Grey Wolf Press in 2020, and a finalist for the Minnesota Book Award in Poetry and the 2021 Kate Tufts Poetry Award from Claremont Graduate University. Roy is a 2019 National Endowment for the Arts Fellow and a 2017 Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Poetry Fellow. And they are currently pursuing a PhD in Comparative Studies in Discourse and Society from the University of Minnesota in the Twin Cities. Please welcome Roy. Thank you so much, Marcy. Um, I feel like every time I do these readings, I gotta do gallery so I don't feel alone. So I got to click on that every time. Um, thank you so much um, to you and to Leslie and to um, Juby and Sam. These are uh, an amazing, amazing readings tonight. And I just want to acknowledge the fact that I live in Minneapolis, um, the site of um, ongoing Black death. And so I just want to say that the work that I'm reading tonight is very much in solidarity with Black Lives Matter, with Dante Wright's family, and of course, in Chicago with Adam uh, Toledo. This poem is um, after the post nightclub shooting in 2016. Restored mural for Orlando. Seconds before the shooter sprays bullets on my brothers and sisters' bodies, the DJ stops the record from spinning. And I'm interested in that brief dazzle of pink light, how it spreads on iron press shirts until they turn purple, how a gun is a heart that has forgotten to sing. 
the rapture in a stranger's eyes, a candid take on resurrection. You visit Orlando to fantasize about the childhood you didn't have. Even though I grew up in Florida, the trip was a luxury because I grew up poor. And when I finally could afford it, afforded, I took my parents to Universal Studios. This is the first time I ever saw my mother get on a roller coaster because she's always been ashamed of her weight. And we ended up buying a timeshare by mistake. I mean, not really by mistake, but by my illusion that my, my, that my parents worked themselves sick in the US, so they needed vacations. And the debt collectors still call us after all these years to remind us of the great recession where my mother lost her job and my father had to go into early retirement. Our mothers gave us names so we would go know what goes at the head of a tombstone, bare presses, and our duty is to feel the isolation that any alignment of letters can trigger when they're carved out of grief, since most of us were born or bloomed out of sorrow, like swans always bent on pond water on or on paid bills, as though we were fishing for useless clues about our graves or where we'll stop to mislead lay our moisture on strangers necks and just the night before i went out for drag night at lush with four other poets one reason to escape my schedule and relive my adolescence i am afraid of attending places that celebrate our bodies because that's also where our bodies have been canceled when you're brown and you're gay you're always dying twice and I got to see 13 performances by amateurs, a special, a few special guests, one queen who happened to make a stop in Minneapolis. She's a national sensation. And the MC sang a raspy but virtuosic version of When You're Good to Mama. And the boys and the girls and the fans all lined up with their dollar bills, which the queen scarfed down with their perfect bosoms and their teeth. And I turned to the net. And I said, the whole performance reminded me of receiving communion as a child. How for me, a church is a roof that's always collapsing. Though I might have been talking about lovers praying, paying their condolences, so often we forget that what kills us now once believed in our survival. But a pistol and a rifle pulled apart can be the shape of your arms as you pull your lover closer, that when his teeth are black, it means you picked the right bottle of Sauvignon, and that in our video games, one can ride a bullet toward eternity. My partner is asked to sing at the vigil in Loring Park. His choir has commissioned an hour-long piece inspired by David Levithan's Two Boys Kissing, in which a pair of teenagers participate in a kissing marathon to set a new Guinness World Record. A Greek chorus of souls who won't be vanquished by the epidemic find comfort narrating the tragic but true events. How can I sing for an entire hour about that much grief without breaking down during the performance? My partner asked me as I scroll through the news. On the phone, my mother says the shooter's hatred sprung from watching two men in Bayside, two men kiss in Bayside Marketplace in the heart of Miami. And I'm imagining how my mother might never approve of me pressing my lips against another man's without that man being my father or a mistranslation of him because even our fathers have prayed at least once for us to be gone. No eres mi hijo maricón. In Bayside, I held an old lover's hand before I moved away to college, the moon upon the water like a wound that would not heal. And he dumped me soon after, said he couldn't bear the pain of me parting, which when you're older, you rank as necessary pain that train you went to open up and shut like a house with only hurricanes moving through it or hasty promises. Orlando, like an orange now green with mold, but edible for some. 
the evening of the shootings after dinner with friends who grieve by not dying. I come home to touch my partner's sweltering body, a humid June evening without AC in Minnesota, far from the carnage, but still so close to feel it. And we produce baby noises and on for witness and on for hope as we give shape to the carefree child of vulnerability that runs between us every evening safe but somehow lost until my lover falls asleep and I stay awake out of need and continue to whisper their names as they're added to the list like faces from a river of baptism. I forgive the earth for not turning its neck further, for not allowing those pink lights to keep flashing, for the cackles to remain intact no matter how boisterous. In those seconds when their skin has never been so bright, so self-assured, the bartender is shaking a piña colada, goosebumps flower on someone's arms, the streets are humming from the light. A pair of lovers walks in, another eagerly awaits the last call of the evening. It would seem the record wants to keep spinning while we wipe their blood from the floor. For them, we learn to touch again. For them, we walk home and we are safe. Thank you. Roy, you are an absolute force. Thank you for that reading uh, and thank you for saying their names and invoking them in this space. Our last reader of the evening, I have the pleasure of introducing um, LGBTQ plus writer, NEA fellow and former Key West Poet Laureate Flower Conroy's first full length manuscript, Snake Breaking Medusa Disorder, was chosen as a winner of the Stevens Manuscript Competition. Her second collection, A Sentimental Hairpin, is forthcoming from Tolson Books. Her poetry will or has appeared in American Poetry Review, New England Review, Prairie Schooner, Michigan Quarterly Review, and others. Please join me in welcoming Flower. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Marcy. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, fellow panelists. Um, I'm just shaking with your words. So thank you very much. Um, I'd like to read two poems that um, were both occasioned for World AIDS Day. Reflecting at White Street Pier 2017. It's easy to get mesmerized here where lapis laluzi waves lap the quay unfolding and the palm fronds sway in the afternoon breeze softening and shadows soften. When I'm here at the edge of the ocean looking across the waterscape and the sun pie balds the surface silver against pockets of blue and blue and blue deeper still, I think I should come here more often. And here is your name, friend, carved in granite at the beginning of this pier so that anyone who ventures here will read your name and that reading will awaken your very in being and the very air will grow headier like when after a season of dormancy, the night jasmine releases its bloomy lanterns into the evening. Do I risk sentimentality? Then I risk sentimentality for if I don't, I haven't risked enough. So momentarily transfixed am I, contemplating or meditating or praying or simply being within this moment, the sea spray spritzing my face. I let out a sigh and surprise myself. The seaweed strewn by tides proclivity punctuates the beach and the horizon beneath the pink and purple clouds now seems somehow nearer, almost reachable, a whispering. Look a sea sponge in the shape of a heart's filigree chamber. And here, mazy as marrow, as a petal, is a chunk of coral rock the currents whittled into a flea-sized grotto. And I feel myself opening inside as the sand feels the weight of the moon-drawn water, as if I'm entering the infinite, the sun's brilliance chiseling through the mystery of space. And a rooster saunters, bronze-breasted, copper-winged, garnet crowned toward the polished tableau, deeply eyeing his ablaze, almost majestic reflection here with you, where you continue in this world of breath and light. 
Hayes Memorial Day, 2018. What's the opposite of sun, of wind? For lost this way is lost forever. Though I have not come to stir up ghosts, no, I have not come to stir up ghosts. And yet, like the silver side of walking through rain and greenery, this faint trace of, is it forest or vine, ledger domains my mind otherwise, and thus I find myself invoking you. The world now opened to the light of edges, like a door in a dream that when the dreamer presses her hand against it shatters into wing and snow, the world now waterfall. A poet once said that the dead are real to us, and I wondered if not real as any memory is, as air is or sand is, each grain in and of itself a complex architecture, angular and laced with sublime brilliance, what if not real shall the dead be? Once I looked to the ocean, and it was as a violin's god hair under wrist sounding from nothing into song note. And once I looked into the dirt and found a clover. And once I, because isn't dream logic no less infinitesimal, no less accurate than other cognitions? The moon and spider thoughts of the late roses dropping their wilted veils onto the garden's damp walkways, for example. What a language it must be webbed as a riddle, ribbed as a web. I've not come to stir up the past, but I know no other way to sit quiet with you and touch your face again. That the dead are real to us, yes. And what wonder a dream kept but uncaged. Behind zoo glass, the feather machine, the hummingbird is, whose wild presence a child for the first time encounters. Suspended creature of flare and nectar, visiting some too beautiful bloom, that kind of marvel, that real you become. You, wing of light and star breath, like planets floating in radial silence above, unseen, unheard, but not unfelt, that real you are. For found this way is found forever. What's the opposite of salt, of forgotten? You, too beautiful bloom, you. Thank you. Thank you, Flower. I'm going to be thinking about that line um, regarding risk and sentimentality for quite some time, among others, of course. Um, that was an absolutely fantastic reading, truly. Uh, thank you to all of our readers. Please join me in, in giving them all a round of applause. Um, before we transition into our moderated conversation, I did want to take a quick moment to speak on why Marcy and I wanted this event to kick off our launch as the PEN America Miami South Florida chapter. We believed that the best way to introduce the work that we want to do as chapter leaders was to curate a space that centered and celebrated the diverse literary landscape of the region that we call home, a region that is often very misunderstood. Um, and because April is National Poetry Month and Marcy and I are poets ourselves, we wanted to feature poets that we admire who are enlarging the canon and their communities right here in South Florida. And we'll touch on that community work a little later um, in some of our questions. But uh, for now, if there are any questions that you would like to ask our fabulous panel, please drop them in the Q&A box below and we will do our best to pose them to the panelists. Um, but before we, we begin with uh, audience questions, we do have a few questions of our own that we would like to begin the discussion with. Um, I've been meditating as you were speaking on uh, various themes that have come up across the reading tonight and thinking about masculinity and gender, uh, queerness, vulnerability. Um, and I'd like to ask all of our panelists, all of our readers, when do you feel most at home in your language? Anyone can start. <laughs> okay. um, I feel most at home when I get lost in the language, when I discover something. Um, I'm always trying to find an image to carry the emotional. Um, when I'm crafting the poem, I, I, I want to think about subtext and how I can layer different sounds or images or enjambment and start to create some subtext behind it. Um, so, I mean, and I, I'm an avid reviser, so I, I like to just get lost 
in the language and poetry, I like to read the dictionary to find new words just to see what will startle me and, and force me out of my comfort zones. Um, so I think when I just don't think about what I'm doing, I'm, I'm most at home in the language. I just let it go and then I can worry about making sense and sorting. That sounds like a liberating process for sure. Thank you. I guess I can go next because I think it's it's in conversation with Flower's um, response. Um, I was thinking very much that when I'm, I feel most at home um, in 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 language when I'm breaking rules, um, when I can see that a verb is no longer a verb when a noun is not just a noun, um, and to me that you know when a form is no longer a form. Um, even even the question of like what is a poem, um, I love that 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 question in my work because then I feel like it's a possibility for something else. I feel like I'm vibing really hard on what you're saying, Roy. I, the idea of verbifying nouns, adjectifying nouns, nounifying verbs playing with language, breaking language, breaking form is, 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 is where I love to play. Um, that and, and for lack of a better term, I don't know I love this term, but it, it exists, code switching. I, I speak differently depending on who I'm talking to. And when I'm in my poems, um, all of that can be called upon and I can, mix all of that on the same page um, in the same line. And, and that's when it feels like I'm doing work. And I mean that in work in the, in the good sense, not like heavy labor, but when I'm really making something hopefully meaningful. Um, that's when I'm in my joy of creating a poem, when I can twist and break and use different modalities of language, if that makes any sense. Um, I think for me, strangely enough, there are so many things that I think about in another language, but English is the most, the language that I'm most comfortable speaking and writing in, not necessarily speaking in, but definitely writing in. And um, some ways in which, because English is such a new language, some ways in which it falters is that it can convey meaning, but it can't necessarily convey depth, right, of what, of another language that I'm, that I'm kind of, that I'm feeling in. Right. And so playing with that to see how I can translate my feelings of depth into English in the manner in which I'm feeling it in another language is, I think, um, where I find, to use Juvie's language, uh, is where I find most joy. You know, that's the exciting part of it. That's the, cha that's the challenge of it. Right. And so that's where, that's, that's where the effort comes in. But also, I think the exploration of can I do it? You know, it's okay if I can't, but can I? You know, being able to ask that question and see what that journey is like. That makes me uh, think of, of a, a little bit expanding on what you all are saying. Um, it makes me think of Pen America's tagline, which is the freedom to write. Um, and and we, we invited you all, you're all from very different regions of Florida, all the way from Key West to the St. Pete, Tampa area, and which covers, it covers a very large regional space. It's very different from, you know, even a few miles difference uh, in South Florida <laughs> as a, just as a, as a space um, in different communities and things. And it, it does make me wonder how, how any, like how language affects your work or impacts it. Yes. But I do wonder too, the, a lot of you write about place, like Roy's Miami poems, or um, you know, some your your poems about being displacement in two different places, you know, uh, or even even occasionally speaking with Flowers World AIDS Day poems, right? Like there's specific things that I think you all are thinking about and that are serving as the catalyst. So how do you how do you sit down and actually wrestle with that kind of work into your into your poems and how do you 
even give language to sometimes what feels like the inarticulable, especially thinking about that these days. Um, I'll just speak about the poems that I read. Um, when I was asked to write the poems for World AIDS Day, I was just absolutely honored, but I knew I also had a really big undertaking, you know, um, a lot of pain and loss that I had to translate in a way that wasn't going to be more depressing, but also enlightening and acknowledging and and hopefully inspiring a little bit. And by taking a really big abstraction and trying to focus specifically on place and speaking to the people who I was in front of, local Key West people, I was able to, I, I think, concretize that emotion. So I, I used my landscape literally to carry the emotion specifically for those poems. I think um, to follow um, Flower's response to that um, writing about Florida has been interesting or editing poems about Florida from a whole different state. It's been really interesting um, because, you know, especially with, with the poem that I read tonight too about Orlando, um, um, in order to act, you know, there's this whole question about like, when is it too soon or when is it right to write about a um, such, such a traumatic public event. And um, I think for me, on the one hand, I saw that there were people writing about the tragedy who were not of that place, right? They were not of the area. And it was very clear because um, they were relying on a lot of abstractions, right? Um, a lot of just like feelings that were not grounded on place. And so I think that um, with your question, Marcy, I remember that one way was to literally, in order to, to, to question my position in writing this kind of poem, I literally, had, I literally had to feel like I was there. What was childhood like, you know, growing up in, in, in Miami? Um, what is this connection to Orlando, right? Like, and so I think that um, for me, it, it activated different memories I had um, of, of these two locations in Florida. And then I was also able to tap into this question of like, instead of the truth, uh, more like my truth, what is my truth about these two locations? And um, it very much, I think that, that, that geography, whether it be imaginary or something that's based on reality, um, it's an excellent place and fruitful place, right? And you're giving, you're giving homage to the land and to the people and the culture there. So it's an excellent place, I think, to, to start um, any kind of work. Hmm. Um, I really vibe with um, what both Flower and, um, and Roy said. It's interesting. My experience, I I'm relatively new to South Florida, I should admit. Um, part of what I vibe with most about South Florida, Florida is what I know of my history. I grew up in Boston um, and my parents are Barbadian, both born there. Um, relocated to Boston because in the late 60s and early 70s, you relocated to where you could find a job. And my father found a job at the Polaroid factory in Waltham, Massachusetts. But I say all this to say is there were thousands of people in Boston who were of a similar history, not necessarily from Barbados, but from Jamaica and DR and Puerto Rico. And so I grew up with this strong sense of Caribbean-ness around me. And I would, not that it's the most um, articulate or enlightened viewpoint, but when I grew up, when I was six and seven, I was like, okay, are you English Caribbean or Spanish Caribbean? And that was sort of, or just plain American. That was my division of the world, the way I understood the world. There were my friends who were English Caribbean, there were my friends who were Spanish Caribbean and then there was Americans. Um, so I grew up in a way where I wanted to know where I would get 
um, my Haitian pate or empanadas or roti um, because I'm not the skinniest person and a lot of how I see the world and experience the world is through food. Um, and I have often chosen where I live by if I know where the roti is or where I can get curry goat um, or where mofongo is. I, these are important things to me and it doesn't feel like a space that welcomes me if I don't know where these things are. So when I came to Florida, and Florida, I think Leslie, you you, you alluded to it in, in the introduction to, to tonight, um, you know, it's, it's misunderstood in many ways. And I think people diminish it in ways that it feels like they should maybe spend two minutes here before they speak about. But I live, Literally, I live in a very gay area in Fort Lauderdale, but I also live in a very Haitian and Caribbean area in Fort Lauderdale. And if I look out my front door, literally 300 feet away is Piman, the Haitian restaurant. And there's another one down the street. And I know where to get pupusas and I know where to get um, empanadas. Um, actually, my husband and I are having a debate about which empanadas are better because we have two places. But I don't know if any of that's useful. That's just that's how I think about location and grounding. And hopefully some of that sometimes comes through in some of my poems. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I can, I kind of sort of relate to what everyone is saying and then to a certain extent also not because, you know, like chronologically speaking for 23 years, I lived in India. I was born and raised there, right? And so, um, Everybody around me was Indian. Yeah, you have, you know, we are we are a diversity of Indians, but we're so used to just everybody being Indian and having these multicultural spaces that weren't, they can be divisive, but they were not as politically divisive. They can definitely be divisive, but they were not as politically divisive as they are um, as they are here, right? From an activism perspective. And so until I was 23, I wasn't a person of color. And then I came to the US and all of a sudden I'm a person of color. In India, I was just queer. That was like my biggest minority status and it was problematic, right? And then I came to the US and suddenly I'm a person of color, I'm queer, wait, wait, oh, I'm immigrant too. Oh no, there's the Muslim aspect as well. You know, like there was like all of these things that just came into play. And that's when I started having to figure out um, geographically, where is my space, right? And when I moved to the US, I didn't move to Florida. I moved to East Lansing, Michigan, right? And so it was a very different experience. Um, I'm sure if I went back to Michigan now, I would absolutely love it because I know how to navigate the US, but now I've been here for 14 years, right? And that was a brand new experience. When you live in India, nobody tells you that there are places like East Lansing, Michigan. Everything that you know, you think it either looks like LA or it looks like San Francisco or it looks like New York or Chicago, right? So you're always thinking the US is built of only big cities, big light, yeah? And then you, then I moved to Florida and I, I will tell you this, I was so miserable in Michigan because, um, you know, I just moved from India. The love of my life then um, was married to the man of her parents choosing. It all happened within those 11 months. Um, I was incredibly heartbroken. It was really depressing. The cold really gets you depressed. And then uh, I had fortunately deferred admission to Tampa, to, to USF. And so when I came here, the moment I landed here and I felt that heat, that same Chennai heat, because we're on the same latitude and longitude as where I live in, in India, right? And so when I came here, and I felt that heat and I felt like, you know, I could smell the ocean. I felt all of that. I was like, all right, I'm gonna be okay. You know, and it gave me kind of this vigor to get out of that, that sad space that I was in. And it felt like home, like I, I connected to it in a way that I hadn't connected before. And so there are just like these different places that you think about in terms of how you connected that, that situational the, the geographical piece of it, but also the emotional piece of it, right? And where your intellect is valued, what spaces in which you can find that your intellect is valued as well. And then you are valued just as an individual for simple things. When I had, when I go back to India, everybody has a problem with my hairstyle. Everyone's making comments about it. Nobody likes it. Everyone's got something to say about it. In the US, all I get are compliments on my hair. Right, and that that situational difference. Thank you, Juby. That situational difference is is just so impactful to how you authentically allow yourself to be 
as well. So that opportunity to become, I found when I came to Tampa. And then that opportunity to, even though it was so much more difficult in India, there were spaces like my undergraduate college, like the theater stage in my master's, those very specific spaces where I felt like there is belonging there. And that was my geographical situationality, if that makes sense. Absolutely. I mean, I think that makes plenty of sense. And I like um, kind of synthesizing everything that was said and thinking about all of the various threads that uh, maybe we we pull on to create a different fabric. So thinking about food, thinking about temperature and all of these things that can evoke a sense of home, even if there is that um, othering in, in the new space. Um, and that kind of leads me into my next question and thinking about um, not just the concept of home, but also um, a built home, a sense of community. Um, I think it's clear from, from the work that you all read uh, tonight that there is this deep connection to, um, to current events, to politics, uh, in a way that uh, suggests um, activism off the page as well. And so I would love to hear um, the panelists talk a bit more about the work that you do in your individual communities. That can be literary based or otherwise. Um, and I'd love to hear about how that sustains you. And maybe that can also kind of serve as a way for us to look to the future as well. And, and if we kind of combine all of this together and think about, um, you know, how misunderstood we are as either transplants or um, immigrants of any kind, it's um, I think it's powerful to think about how we can change the circumstances in a space by doing that work on the ground. So I would love to hear everybody kind of weigh in on, on, on the work that they're doing um, in their regions. I can go first if that's okay. Um, the reason why I'm ready to go first is because I have the most incredible job in the world. Um, I work with young humans. Um, I run um, leadership programs for young humans in high school um, in the Tampa Bay area on um, inclusion and anti-discrimination, um, where we talk about discrimination systems of oppression, how those manifest in our own behaviors and how we navigate the world as those um, systems of oppression work against us. So working with young humans, I think, you know, is not to sound tokenizing, but it is my pride and joy, right? And it's such a, it's, it's, such a selfishly fulfilling job because young humans are so, this just so bloody awesome, right? And there's so much better than most adults that I ever interact with. We, get, we have such amazing conversations about everything. Um, and they're just, they're so intelligent and their perspective, I haven't been a young human, I haven't been in high school for the last 18 years now, right? So I'm just so fascinated by the level at which Fascinated is the wrong word. I'm so inspired by the level at which they are constantly doing the things and the level to which they understand things and are willing to bring compassion to the table over everything else. I mean, if we want to learn about love being a revolutionary act, young humans are the way to go, right? Um, and they're so open and so ready to learn, but also just so ready to love you, right? When they hear about like, when, when they understand better my identities and they ask about the work that I do and they hear where I come from, et cetera, et cetera. They create such a space of solidarity and support for me. It's just so wonderful to see them do that without even asking. And with most adults who are supposed to be your allies, you ask and you ask and you ask and you still never get. You know, if it's not transactional, it's not worth their time. Usually that's how I feel about it, right? And so that's like, that. that's the space in which I just, on a bad day, it's my young humans that fill my cup and let me know, you know what, it sucks today, but it also sucked yesterday, which only means that tomorrow can get better. And um, I absolutely love remembering that about them because they're just such a wonderful, powerful group of humans. And if everybody, if we changed our rules to make sure that only people under the age of 18 voted, I mean, we'd be, we'd be far on our way to, prog to progress.
Um, I don't feel as if I do enough in the community, but I wanted to go after Sam because I want to echo something very strongly that you're saying, Sam. I had the opportunity um, this past fall to lead a poetry workshop with a group of ninth graders um, in the Bronx, actually, through House of Speakeasy. And it was the most ridiculously joyous experience I have had. Well, certainly in 2020, but in a long time. They were just so accessible and open and willing to share and willing to be brave and silly and embracing. And I, I just loved it. Um, and I say part that partially because I think going forward, I need to find ways um, to work with young folks more because it, 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 it saves me. Um, it teaches me. Interestingly, we had a conversation because one day we decided to have this debate about voting and a couple of the kids in class, and this speaks to, I don't know what about the war, but a couple of kids in the class were concerned about letting young people vote because they think we, the adults, um, would try to control their votes and we, the adults, have the power and the purse strings and therefore, even though it would be a nice idea, it's dangerous. But that nuance and that depth was heartbreaking at the same time it was brilliant and made me check myself and really rethink a lot of things. You just made me think of that, Sam, and I wanted to share that because I just, I loved every bit of that. Um, a lot, I will say, um, my activism has recently been centered around poetry and trying to uh, mentor younger poets um, that way and through helping folks who want to apply to MFA programs. But I do feel like the moment calls for more outspoken activism, Black Lives Matter, Queer Lives Matter, Trans Lives Matter. Um, and it's not a time to be silent. And, you know, beyond that, um, we just got to get into it. Um, to save us. I'll, I guess I'll go next. Thank you for, um, for sharing those thoughts, um, Yubi and, and Sam, about like working with children. Um, one of the things that I was thinking about with your question, Leslie, was like, for me, um, why, why would I leave Florida, right? Why would I come to a place like Minnesota, for instance? And um, I think a, at the heart of a lot of these questions is the question of community. And um, when I was hearing Sam talk, I realized that one very one one way to tap into a kind of community in a location is through the schools schools you know universities and things like that and um i remember that i came here like in hearing y'all talk like i came to minnesota because i wanted to get an mfa in creative writing because i wanted to work specifically with a um a latinx poet and um I, I didn't want to do the heat. <laughs> I mean, I love Miami, I love Miami, but I cannot do the heat. And I knew I didn't want to go to the Southwest because of that. And I also didn't want to go to California because it was too expensive. And so I was like, I, I know I'm familiar with the Midwest. I had lived in Chicago before. So I ended up working with Ray Gonzalez here in, in the MFA program at the University of Minnesota. And I stayed to do a PhD um, because of community. It was basically by meeting not just like Black, Li Black Lives Matter, Matter activists, but also by meeting um, 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 indigenous like, you know, um, like, like healing practitioners, uh, um, I mean, I met, I met everybody here, right? Um, the idea that I was in, in a location with you know so many Somalis, right? So many Hmong people, um, so many Koreans. I mean, to me, that like was something that I lacked when I was in Miami. Of course, that's changed so much in South Florida. But um, I think, uh, in terms of my 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 poetry, I, that's the work that I try, I try to do of, of advocacy and 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 whatnot. But I think what Juby was saying is very much true that we also have to go beyond the page, and so. Um, the, the PhD that I'm working on, um, it's basically trying to center LGBTQ um, lives from Central America 
and these are lives that like don't get you know they, they don't get a page basically and so um by bringing in testimonials right by bringing in practices that also a lot you know i can pay the people i'm interviewing like these are all practices that um are a part of what i do and so yeah but i mean you know it's minneapolis right so like when it comes to conversations about like um, you know, not just defunding the police, but, you know, abolition, like all of that is go happening here. It's such a fervent place for that. Unfortunately, you know, it's also the place that these conversations are happening because of all of the situation, you know, the crisis happening too. Thank you. Um, I'm very involved with the community down here, um, the gay community, the literary community. Um, and a lot of my, you know, I've been here 20 years and um, I've done a lot of fundraising for lots of different endeavors, um, hospice, AIDS help, BNA, Visiting Nurse Association, um, Samuel's House, Sister Season, which um, One Human Family. Um, and if this is a little more silly, but I'm the first woman to have won the Queen Mother pageant. And <laughs> you just think I'm go, go, goody. Um, and I'm Queen Mother 23, but that started as a backyard fundraiser for helping pay bills for people that had contracted AIDS and literally couldn't pay their bill and were sick and people didn't quite know what was going on. So, I mean, I've, it's silly, but it's very dear to my heart because it, it is, it is a good cause. And like I said, it's raised, it's since 83. So we've raised tens of thousands of dollars indirectly, indirectly. Um, doing that. So um, fundraising for the community has always been extremely important to me. And when I became Poet Laureate, I was able to use literary, you know, the literary angle a little bit more to fundraise for, you know, studios of Key West. And, and those are important because they make space for other voices. So, I mean, you know, I, I feel like I'm participating and of course I need to participate more and there's much, much more work to always be done. And I definitely need to make sure I do the work too. So thank you. We're running a little bit out over time, but um, before we close out this conversation part, which has been incredible, I do want to honor that we have one question from the audience um, and they're asking all the panelists, how often do you pull on personal experience for your work and have you felt pressured to create in that space more as activists or do you also have the creative license to infuse fiction into your poems? How do you separate them if you do? I, I'll, I'll let, try to answer that question. Um, I go back, it, it's so interesting because the, the question that, um, this excellent question that's being posed to us is something that, um, very much reminds me about things like confessional poetry right and like the ways in which like something like confessional poetry gets like it it gets derided right it gets you know what whatnot but um one of the things that i will say is that when it comes to um i think that the word that that was part of the question was um activism I like to think that activism is something that is part of my core. So it it doesn't really change based on genre. It's something that 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 like bleeds into everything that I do from short story, you know, and I'm someone who loves working in different genres, from short stories to essays to uh poetry to I mean anything, I would say um activism is a part of it. Um, but the other thing that that about the question that's being asked is, um, I, I'm I'm constantly being reminded that the poem, um, and, and the poem especially is is not as people tend to think of. Um, this is not the court of law, right? Like this is not the place where you're about to give like a test, like you're providing a testimonial for a case, right? And so the 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 ways in which I bring in fiction. Um, is through things like the metaphor, right? The metaphor allows me to, especially when I'm coming across issues, subjects, feelings that I just don't even have the language for. Sometimes, you know, sometimes just bringing in a deer, right? And having that deer drink some water over here, like 
does so much work for me, even if it feels fictional, than just saying, I don't know how to write about this experience, right? And so I feel like at the end of the day with poetry, it's not just about what is the story being told, but also like what are the kinds of like um, um, images, feelings that you're triggering right through, through the poem. I'm sorry. Yeah, I agree with um, a lot of what you said, Roy. Um, I based a lot of my poems in my life, but I don't want the poem to be my life. You know, I, I have to have distinction. It can't be my life. I, no, nobody wants to read that shit. Um, it's got to be interesting, you know, so I have to make it interesting. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I live in this body. I occupy this head. Um, so I need to, to write that from that. I, and, you know, from my relationship with another woman, from just walking this earth, you know, I, I, all of that has to come in, but it doesn't always have to be present. It doesn't have to be, like you said, testimony. It doesn't have to be fact, but it, it has to be real. I like what you're saying, Flower and Roy, because it, it's, it's a fascinating question. And I think where you, you've tapped into something, it, there's this notion that confessional poetry somehow is, sometimes depending on who's asking or who's talking, it's something of a lesser category. And it's something of an elevation if we get beyond confessional poetry, except we all poets, like Flower is saying, we all write from personal experience. There's a difference though, between writing from personal experience and literally recounting factual information. It's not what we, not the poets I've met, it's not what we literally do most of the time. Um, like we're always saying, sometimes you need that deer and the deer could be a knife or a different location than something actually happened. We're trying to make meaning sometimes. I know a lot of times I'm trying to figure out something in the world. So I don't tell you necessarily, literally an experience I had, I might remove myself from that experience so I can look at it and, and, and regard the different facets of it and talk about it and see where I end up. But I think we have to start thinking, you know, each and every personal experience can be pulled on for a poem. And that doesn't diminish the poem specifically or poetry in general. It's, I don't know how you write from a place that is entirely absent of personal experience. I, I understand the difference between personal experience and confessional poetry, but our personal experiences are political to to speak to the to the activist piece of it. It is impossible to walk through the world and not have to make a series of political decisions, sometimes even moment by moment, which street we turn down, whether we walk alone down that street. It's all political. So it's I don't know how to extricate the political from my poetry. It I walk through the world looking like this. Every second to everything that Jivi just said, the personal is political. And at the same time, I'm a huge fan of compartmentalization. Um, I know, you know, every therapist will tell you that you probably shouldn't do that, but it's such a great coping mechanism that I will swear by it regularly, right? Sometimes the PTSD is just not worth it. Um, and yet there is this um, commitment or this feeling of responsibility, which I don't see as pressure, but a feeling of responsibility to communicate the very real life experiences that you've had without necessarily having to put yourself through this heavy level of emotional turmoil and, you know, psychological trauma, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not interested in revisiting my trauma all the time in order to be able to create a piece. And so I think creating the boundaries of, yes, my story needs to be visible, but it needs to be visible because there is a lesson to be learned there. And there are other people going through this that need not feel isolated the way that I felt isolated when I was going through it. And I have the, I'm going to develop, even if I don't have the tools, I'm going to find, I'm going to develop the tools. I'm going to talk to other poets who are using these tools that they have developed for themselves and ask them if they can teach me how to do it and create those boundaries where I'm constantly asking my trauma for consent.
That's so powerful, Sam. I think it really does go back to that idea of systems of care that need to be in place before, um, you know, the the work that's done off the page and what's on the page can sort of collide or, or, or find a, um, a, a safe intersection. That seems to me like a perfect note for us to end on. Um, Sam, Juby, Flower, and Roy, my goodness. <laughs> I'm so grateful to have, um, to have been able to share this space with you. Thank you so very much for an excellent reading and conversation. Um, I, I'm sure uh, the rest of the audience, in addition to myself, will be thinking about your poems and, and ways of seeing and being for, for some time. Um, for those of us who are still here, if you enjoyed this event and want to hear the latest about what the new PEN America Miami South Florida chapter is up to, um, you can sign up for our newsletter. We'll go ahead and drop a link to that newsletter registration in the chat. We also want to encourage you to become a member of PEN America. Uh, you don't need to be based in South Florida to, to join, although I think based off of um, some introductions that we had in the chat, a number of us are um, in South Florida right now. Um, you know, we, we'd love to increase our membership at home and, and we hope to work with and meet our regional members once it's safe for us to gather in person. Um, but we'll also include a link uh, on more information on how to become a member. Um, I also want to encourage you to watch this space. This was our kickoff event, but um, we are, we've got some exciting things in the works for you coming up. So um, that also includes our acknowledgement of World Press Freedom Day, which is right around the corner on Monday, May 3rd. So absolutely watch this space for more. And again, we just want to thank all of our partners. We appreciate your support and thank you to the audience for spending your Thursday evening with us and helping us mark the creation of this chapter. Uh, Marcy and I are going to stick around just for a couple of minutes in case anybody has any questions about the new chapter or just wants to connect. Um, you can also email us. Uh, we're going to drop that email there as well. So all of these resources uh, will be in the chat. So please feel free to, to email us. Let us know how, uh, how you felt about the event as well as any ideas you may have uh, or anything that you believe this chapter should, should focus on as far as um, events and resources. We, we want to hear from you and make sure that you feel represented in this chapter. So thank you so much, everyone. We appreciate it. One more round of applause, I suppose. I think you all deserve it. <laughs>